how high? Well, well, well. What can I tell you? Except that I'm ecstatic, nervous, uh, hoping I deliver uh, what God wants you to hear f through me. So let's pray. Lord, we recognize your presence in the Eucharist here in the tabernacle and in this wonderful community in which you have invited me. Um, I ask you to be in my mind, in my heart, and um, on my lips as I talk to these people about your version of love and uh, as it is translated into marriage. Help me to um, be effective. But help everyone here to be open to change and to, you know, enlightenment and to laughter and to growth and to the challenge of being married because we know it's not easy, but it is an extraordinarily wonderful, wonderful calling in life. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, I tell you, I, it's like being at my own wake. Uh, <laughs> You know, I can't, I can't tell you, at this time in my life, I'm probably happier than I've ever been uh, because I experience more love than I ever did from you, really. You have just helped me to, you know, to keep on going and uh, as a happy man, a happy priest. And also, uh, you have helped me with my vocation because it's, you know, you have your vocation of marriage and so on, and I have this vocation to be a priest, and I want to uh, do it well. I don't, I never turn back, but if it weren't for you, I could never be the priest that I am today, and I always want to be genuine. I want to be, you know, I don't want to lose my faith and keep the job. <laughs> I, I, I want to have the faith and the job at the same time. And so tonight, I am absolutely thrilled uh, with you being here. And I am, uh, I'm not emotional or anything, but uh, <laughs> this morning I was at St. Uh, Ed's High School for mother-son uh, marriage and so on. And, you know, that's another kind of event. You know, yesterday you're at St. Bernadette's and it's uh, the eight Beatitudes. This is one uh, wonderful life that I've been given. And uh, it is certainly not for me. It's, it's for you to see God beyond me and for me to have the privilege, the wonderful privilege, to talk to you about life and Christ and love and marriage and children and life and death. You know, what more serious subjects could we have? So anyway, I did turn 85 last week, and so many of you knew it because I told you. I announced <laughs> you know, and I got so, I got so much attention. I, I, I have diabetes too, they tell me, I don't know. And you know, if I ate all that sugar, we'd have a funeral tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, but honestly, I can't explain to anybody else the wonder of my life uh, as lived through you. Uh, when I was first ordained, I was sent to Medina, and then now, in these later years, I end up here. And honestly, I just feel like I'm uh, rejuvenated and reborn as a, as a new priest because you act to me more like it was in the early days, because I never became a pastor or anything. You know, I wasn't that smart. <laughs> <laughs> that dumb. Uh, <laughs> wasn't that. <laughs> so uh, my life took off in another way, and you just do what you do. So anyway, uh, I just, uh, really, I'm just, I can't get to you until I get over myself because it's just so wonderful to me if every priest could have the love and the attention and the affirmation uh, that I get, uh, everybody would want to be a priest. But we were told the night before we were attending, don't you bring people to yourself, bring them to God. And that is always my thought. You know, I love your, <laughs> your love for me. And it's wonderful, but I know that it must not stop there. It must always be 
to Christ in the Eucharist, Christ in the Scripture, uh, Christ, you know, here tonight. So anyway, uh, a couple of months ago, I don't know, someone said, how would you like to do this tonight? And I, yeah, you know, just, yeah, you know, just, you really get dumb as you get older, and you say, whatever you say, sir, and, and, and my God, I said yes, and here we are. I cannot believe that you uh, are out there, and I so, so want to uh, measure up to your needs and your expectations, because I want you not living here loving me. I want you loving your wife and your husband, and I know it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's, it's an effort, you know, it's a happy, sad thing, but I just hope you keep on going. Yesterday I was at St. Bernadette's in the afternoon for Mass, and there was this beautiful little couple, you know, and they were having their 65th, and uh, <laughs> they didn't want to renew their vows. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and. <laughs> I said, are you sure you want him? You sure you want her? <laughs> no, there was so, you know, we do, you know, in spite of ourselves, we grow into marvelous people. We really do grow into marvelous people. And this couple, they were, they were just marvelous, especially because she pressed $50 into my hand at the end. You know, I... <laughs> So anyway, that was yesterday, and so today we have a lot of people who are on their way, but you're not at 65 years of marriage. Well, every, uh, they, they build this tonight, you know, as kind of a revival or something, and um, I feel like I'm going back to Broadway after many years of being absent, because I don't give talks anymore much. I just don't, because they don't ask me. And now... <laughs> Now I say, well, I don't know, maybe you can do that. You know, and I wake up this morning, are you going to do that? Yes. So here is a little bullheaded midget, 85-year-old cleric, <laughs> celibate, talking to you about marriage. <laughs> so what do you think of that? I mean, is life perverse or... You know, it's, it's paradoxical anyway. So since you wanted to have so much fun, I thought I'd give you two... Uh, they're good jokes, but they're old jokes. But you like that, and so I'm going to start with two jokes, and then I'm going to get serious. Are you ready for this? Have you heard this one? I'm sure you have. It's been around for about a year. It was about the guy that went into the bank in uh, Dublin, Ireland, and he had a mask on, and he held up the teller and got the money. And on the way out, he was escaping, and someone ripped his uh, mask off his face. And uh, uh, so he shot her dead. And then he looked at the teller that saw his face and shot her dead. And then he said, did anybody else around here see my face? You know this, don't you? And one little voice said, I think, I think me wife had a glimpse. <laughs> I don't, I don't pretend to think that any life is easy, mine nor yours, but I think mine is easier. I really do. But, you know, fulfilling in its own way, because God just put us here and said, now this is what I have in mind for you. Now you do this, see? Do this. So the most important day of your life is when you're born, and the second is when you know when he said, you do this. And I think for you, married people, he said, now you do this. This is your calling. So it isn't just a 
sentimental moment, you know, when we spend thousands of dollars to look beautiful and hand out champagne and cut the cake and smash it. That's not, no, life is much deeper than that. So anyway, we joke about marriage in order to lubricate it. And that's why in my office, I was 21 years as a marriage counselor for the diocese, and I had uh, a book of uh, jokes out there, you know, uh, cartoons in these books that I collected. And uh, very few were looking at them, I'll tell you that, you know. <laughs> You check out the jokes, no. You know, they're in deep trouble. And I know, see, the, you know, when we, when we describe life dramatically on stages, we use two faces, don't we? We use the smile and the frown, because life is joy and sorrow. And have you learned that yet? Have you accepted it yet in your marriage? Because it is that. For everybody, anybody, it's just life. So get used to that. Enjoy the sorrow. You know, it's okay. And just don't be a wimpy person sitting back, you know, expecting everything to be the way it should be, the way you want it to be. It is not that way. So in, um, in my uh, life, I've always thought maybe we could uh, lubricate the pain of life and I say that again, lubricate the pain of life with laughter. And one of the first things I would ask of you, uh, and you don't have to raise your hands or anything, but I always, uh, there's a whole talk on this. Tonight I'm just doing, you know, I thought, what can I do in an hour? Because I have hours and hours of talks on marriage, hours. And I say, are you any fun to be with? Are you any fun to live with? Because if you're not fun, you know, I want out. And there's, uh, you know, the other night, someone, you know, it was on the phone, just on a, no, it came to pick me up to, for something. And, you know, uh, you know, we were in slacks and all this stuff. And I said, uh, are we wearing tails tonight or tux? He said, no, those jeans are okay. <laughs> you're not laughing, I am. <laughs> That's where you are, you no, know, the genes are okay. I mean, never got the humor. If you don't get the humor of life, you are done in. Laughter, joy is the best thing, and I know that I will repeat myself a hundred times tonight, but uh, once I was giving talks in Hollywood, uh, Florida, in this church, and they had etched in the side of the church, which I have told you before, joy, joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. And I see all these people walking around with their, their Bibles and, you know, and all this, you know, and doing all this. And, I, you know, are you any fun to be with? You know, they're, they're doing chapter and verse. I do pages. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so anyway. Do you want to hear the other joke? I was, this, this, oh my God, I'm spending 20 minutes on an introduction. It was supposed to, <laughs> supposed to be two minutes. Um, you probably know this, but be kind. If, you know, it was this couple that went to the doctor's office because the husband was sick. And after the doctor saw him, he called her in and he said, your husband is sicker than you think. And he said, uh, you know, you can do a lot for him, though. Actually, it's a matter of life and death. What I want you to do is get up in the morning, you know, before he does, and have a lovely breakfast for him. And since he comes home for lunch, be there, have a lovely lunch, you know. And then when he comes home in the evening, you know, have all the dogs and the kids, uh, you know, silent, and greet him, you know in cellophane or something, you know, it's green, yeah, with love, yeah, and give him a martini or two or something, you know, and make it a happy hour, and then give him a wonderful, wonderful dinner, and then uh, give him all the sex he wants. And she said, okay. 
So anyway, on the way home, the two of them were driving home, and he said, the husband said, what did he tell you? She says, you're going to die. <laughs> You got it. <laughs> so I can speak now about the ideals of marriage and, and your needs and your wants and, and uh, how you get there. I hope I can do it. And actually, I was going to read the scripture, but, you know, since I've... I'm not going to do it right now. I just let it go. Uh, let's do this. Why did you come here? I know why you came here. So your husband would change. <laughs> and I know why you came here. So your wife would change. Because that's how we are. There's the old story about the married couple, you know, uh, the marriage, I mean, the couple getting married, and, and uh, she's standing there in all her beauty and glory and on their veils and so on, and she's kind of looking up at him and he's looking down at her, and what is she saying? I'll change him. What is he saying? She'll never change. <laughs> Both are wrong, and you know that. So what I want you to do to make this really not just uh, word service, I want you please for a moment to make it as personal as I can. Remember your wedding day, please. Close your eyes. Hold his, her hand. You remember when you got married? Remember how wonderful that was? And you said something like this. I take you for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness, in health, in good times, and in bad times, until I die, or you die. So just remember that for a moment tonight, because, you know, we're so, so busy and so distracted. I really want you to remember <laughs> that day. And I remember when I was ordained. And I said, I'll, I'll live that life. I will live that life. I will live that life. So you go back to that. And uh, hopefully, uh, you come here tonight, to, not that your spouse will change, but maybe You'll hear, you'll hear one kernel, you know, one moment, one, the one thought that you say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's me, and I'm going to continue to do that because I do it well. Or, you know, I really need to change that. That would be wonderful because life is constant change. There's nothing so constant in life as change. And... So many people are always talking about the way it was. How is it? Not the way it was. How is it? How's your life? How's your marriage? How's my priesthood? I'm not the guy I was 55 years ago. I'm me now with all the changes and the um, challenges of being a priest in these years and these times. Now you have to grow. That's the meaning of marriage. You're not in there just to raise children, you're to raise each other. So if you have that in mind, you say, you know, I'm becoming, I'm not the man I was, I'm not the woman I was, I'm not the bride I was, I'm not the husband I was, I am constantly becoming somebody else. And that is wonderful. I want to keep on growing until I die. So, okay. You remember when, uh, I think God has a sense of humor. He made you fall in love to get married. I'm getting married in the morning. Ding dong, the wells are going to chime. You know, he puts that in you. How else would you make those promises? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's an emotional, passionate thing. 
And, you know, as much as we tell you it's not going to stay that way, uh, you don't believe that. You say, no, I'll always be, you know, wild about Harry. I'll always be wild about Mary. You know, I'll just be wild. Well, it doesn't last, uh, if you're honest. It, you go from illusion, uh, you know, what you thought marriage was going to be, to what it really is. And I've had people, honestly, I had a, you know, as a marriage counselor, 21 years, I had this woman come in on a Tuesday, and I said, uh, she said, I want a divorce. And I said, how long have you been married? Uh, since Saturday. <laughs> Called you on Monday, but you weren't here. <laughs> I, so, <laughs> you people are, they love weddings, they just don't like marriage. <laughs> they do, and that's why, you know, I don't mean to judge any of you, but I wish you wouldn't spend so much on the wedding. I really wish you would not. It's foolish money. It's the marriage between you and God and Christ and, a, and on someone you're gonna spend your life with. And it's not dazzle, it's not that. And when you talk about forty and fifty thousand dollars for a wedding, and you have designation weddings, I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, I went—I don't know—I don't even remember the island somewhere off of Italy, and they got divorced in two years. So, you know, I had to pay my own way. That bothered me. <laughs> but, so, so are you beyond? That's my question. Are you beyond illusion? Are you beyond illusion? The priesthood is not at all what I thought it was going to be. It's even better, but it's not uh, perception. It's what it is. So you have these childish ideas about marriage and, um, you know, in a magazine and the bride looking this way and all. You know that that's very, very, very superficial. It doesn't mean diddly. So it, it's in here. So have you gone beyond illusion to disillusionment? Someone has said it doesn't matter who you marry because the person you wake up on Monday morning is somebody else. Because we are different. But when you get married, you know, and I'm your husband and your wife, you know, we're in here forever. Uh, a lot of people aren't up to that. I wasn't. <laughs> I, uh, no, I don't, I shouldn't have put that in there, but I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that I could do it. And that's why I feel a little hollow, you know, talking to you about marriage, which I myself don't experience, but my, my experience is via others. So have you gone to beyond illusion and disillusion to death, which is the, the wedding feast of Cana? Good wine, no wine, best wine. Have you done that? Uh, just, you know, want you to think about that. It's not what you thought it was going to be at all. But you have to get through that. And a lot of people who don't just keep going back to the illusion part, that's why they have six, seven, eight marriages, you know, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, whatever. You know, they just keep going back. They want illusion. and They don't want the real thing. Do you want the real thing? I hope you say, I do. I'm real. I want to be real about my life. It's my life. No two words uh, reach my heart like it's my life. What am I doing with my life? My life. And if I have handed my life, as it were, over to you to share it with you, I hope you are like up to it or worthy and we're both worthy of that because we're into this thing now forever till death. So uh, the disillusionment part, you want to joke? I think it's time. Um, I was, you know, I'm a marriage counselor. I got all these stories. I could write a bunch of books. But uh, this one couple came to me and uh, she said, he doesn't love me. I said, oh, OK. Uh, what makes you think so? She said, well, she said, we were on a trip. We were in a car, 
and we were driving, you know, forever and ever, and we had to go to the gas station to get gas, and she got out of the car to use the ladies' room. So that's enough. So, but the thing is that he paid for the gas, and he took off. He forgot she was there. <laughs> so I, I know I was another 40 miles to the next exit, and then came back. Can you imagine him standing there, honey? And they were in a Volkswagen. You know, it's, <laughs> honey, I, I, just, I know your purse is here, but I just, I just, you know, how do you get out of that? Because that's who you might be married to, who someone <laughs> forgot you went to the ladies' room. <laughs> I mean, there are all kinds of, uh, as a marriage counselor, you know, I would, a lot of people didn't want to come to me because they knew they would show up in the lecture that night. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they did. This old couple, and I, uh, my office was down at the Chancery for all those decades, and this old couple, I never knew who was coming in next, you know, it was all, uh, they came in. And <laughs> they came in, and this old couple, and I, I didn't know how in the hell they got downtown and up to my office, but there they were. <laughs> and I don't know, do you, do you kind of, uh, describe people, I, I'm, I do a little bit. She was a crane, you know, she, she craned in. <laughs> you got the picture? He was a turtle. <laughs> so I always, I always call him the crane and the turtle. And, you know, you finally get them settled. <laughs> I mean, I had a hell of a life, I'll tell you, I did. You know, because I, I, I just enjoyed them. But um, I said, no, okay, you got all the way down here. What is your problem? What can I do for you? And she says, he is still running around after me. And I could see him going, I said, some, I said something like, he may, I mean, he wants your body. <laughs> and then I said, he wants your body? <laughs> so, so I, <laughs> I just here to tell you that if you're thinking the guy's going to get over it, he ain't. <laughs> he ain't going to get over it until he is dead and buried three days, three days. So anyway, I, so they moved on anyway, I don't know. Then uh, I would have people send me cartoons to keep in the office uh, reception room so that, you know, we keep some humor. And most of the people didn't, you know, they were in there for problems. They didn't want to laugh at anything. But uh, people would send me these cartoons, uh, and I have bundles of them at home in, car, uh, in uh, binders about the jokes that I accumulated during those years as a marriage counselor, and the humor on marriage is enormous. But anyway, uh, just to give you one example, one sent me this um, uh, cartoon, and it said, Underneath, it was a couple, you know, mean looking like this. And they said, uh, we stayed together for the kids and the little buggers put us in the same nursing home. <laughs> so, now, I think, uh, I, I, I hope I can keep it light. Cause, and I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying this moment with you. And I, I know that, you know, you can laugh and everything, but I, I do want you to be happy and make the most of your marriage. You've got to be de determined. You've got to be determined. You've got to grow up and realize marriage is not like you thought it was going to be. 
It isn't, nor is this priesthood. It's not. But that's how life goes. You, when you're younger, you expect a lot and so on. And so uh, you got to, that's what I'm hoping tonight. You'd say, what I got out of that is I'm determined I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you the rest of my life. And we're going to love each other, aren't we, dear? I would love that. I really would love that. Because, you know, it isn't any more just sexual atta attraction or emotion and that stuff. It's, it's the real thing. <laughs> you know, and a lot of you do it. And I hope you do it. And I hope you're happy that you're, you're working at it. Now, you've had children. And the thing about that is it's wonderful. It's a product of love. It gives you, well, real meaning of life. You begin to forget yourself and think of them. But the problem with it is that you are thinking of them and not each other anymore. You must, you must, you must survive your kids. You're going to spend more years together as husband and wife than daddy and mother. And the people who hold on to their kids like they do, you know, don't leave me and so on, are selfish. They don't allow their kids to grow up. And the kids think, why don't you love each other and have a life of your own without us? And so that's a big point I'm trying to make here because you can't hold on to your kids. You've got to love them enough to let them go. And that's the cost of parenthood. And it's the price of marriage. That the marriage must must survive the kids. And in earlier days, I think one day I talked about Cana here uh, in church and talked about, you know, uh, the, the brevity of life. But now we're living, you know, a very long time. You are going to live many, 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 many more years without your children than with them. And if you don't have a love between you that sustains you and uh, propels you on, and all you want to do is hold on to your kids, you are selfish. And you are not a good parent. I know kids that, you know, keep going back to their parents because they trained them to be like that. What is the thing you say on the day of the marriage, or sometimes is read at least, you leave your father and your mother and you cling to your spouse. And I'm just urging you to stop being vertical and be horizontal, vertical. Uh, it's natural. It's not an earned thing to love your boys and girls. Who wouldn't? But you have to love them to, enough to let them go. And if that takes over and you don't advance into the love of husband and wife on a horizontal level, then you have not grown up. And I can't say that often enough because that's a huge problem in marriage. You just don't want to give up give up on the kids. No, the purpose of parenting is to put yourself out of business. Raise them so that they can raise them other kids. And then you can go on with your husband and your wife and say, we don't need them anymore. We changed the locks. <laughs> but anyway, I want to dwell on a I, I, I'm never going to get finished tonight because I have so much to say. But uh, it's okay. If I don't finish, it doesn't matter, does it? Uh, you want intimacy, don't you? If there's anything about celibacy that is difficult, it is the lack of intimacy, not sex. Not sex. You know, that, uh, that's, but that's not the big thing. It's intimacy. It's... It's the closeness of being bonded to another person in heart and mind and soul and sexuality. And, and that, isn't, isn't that what you want? Because God said it's not good to be alone. So, uh, you know, you, are you risking, are you working at, you know, being a husband and a wife? Just, <laughs> we got to do this. You know, whatever it takes, and I hope to get to what it takes, but that's what we want. And some woman, I've dealt with so, so many people, 
And she says, you must be lonely, Father. Well, I said, I do live a lonely life, a lone life. She says, but there's nothing like being alone and married. You're married and you're stuck, but there is no intimacy. You're just a couple of people going through motions. And if you are like that, you have my sympathy. I mean, I'm not here to judge you, and I'm just here to promote an ideal and so on, but I'm kind of encouraging you to, you know, have the guts to get intimate with your mind, your heart, your soul, uh, your body, your sexuality, you know, to become one. I mean, I do hope so. Anyway, so you want intimacy, you want companionship. So many people say, you know, if they've lost their spouse, you know, I don't know where to go anymore. Because, you know, I always had someone on my arm. Now, me, my own life, I go everywhere, I, not to restaurants alone, but I go to the movies alone, but not too many other places alone. Uh, that's, that's one part of celibacy that, you know, you wish, you wish someone were here. I think that's why your intimacy with me here at St. Joe's, after mass back there, you make me feel I'm part of you. Because everybody's got to have somebody on their arm. And that's what marriage is. And that's what you really lose when you lose a spouse. I don't want to go out anymore alone. I want to go with somebody. So you want companionship. Third thing you want is sensuality. I grew up in a, <laughs> oh, I don't think I should tell you. <laughs> the only sex education I had, and I remember that, you know, because we go, <laughs> I remember I touched my crotch with diapers. And my mother said, don't you touch yourself down there. Okay. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> I just think God has the greatest sense of humor to call me to be, but to be me to be a marriage counselor. Hell, I didn't know the facts of life. <laughs> I did not, nor did my mother. <laughs> my father rolled in his sleep. That's, that's how I got here. But, So anyway, we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> we have finally, uh, we as a society, not as a Catholic society so much, but isn't it wonderful for you to be sensual and sexual? It's a wonderful part of life. But if there's any taboo, you know, in the Catholic conscience, it's that, you know, this, don't touch, don't look, don't think, don't speak, don't, you know. And, oh, I just think it's so criminal. And I'm okay with it, you know, at my age. However, you do know that it, the desire never goes away. That, that's always there. But I do hope you can fulfill your desires as a whole person, completely naked, mentally, emotionally, historically, memorably, uh, physically, and be all open and naked to somebody else. Sensuality, that's your privilege, that's your gift. It's not bad, unless you're Irish. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing I think you want is what we call synergy. That's a little bit about my celibate life. You know, I, I, I'm, always, I'm out here and this is wonderful, wonderful. I mean, who can ask for anything more? 
But uh, I do go home alone. I come here alone from a, a and I'm okay. But it is just always, you know, it's not normal to live your life all by yourself all the time. But it, it's okay because I I accept that. I've been called to do that, and I do that. But God. If somebody comes to my house, I get synergized, I get energized. There's one guy that used to live next door to me that's always my companion, and he comes because I don't know anything about, you know, everyday stuff. I don't. But he comes along and he figures out what's wrong with the electricity, what's wrong with the uh, water, uh, the windows, and everything else. And when he comes, I get a lot done because it's synergy. And it's the energy that comes from two people. One and one equal 11. Isn't that nice to work together? I hope you have that. And you know, you know, we're energizing each other. I hope uh, that what you want is adventure. One of the greatest things in marriage to me is boredom. And sometimes I get involved in a boring marriage. I, oh my God. You know, I'm invited over. I, oh. Do you need me? Oh, and nothing going on over there. There's no fun. There's no laughter. And there's no adventure. You haven't done anything. It's just tapioca. It's just, uh, I mean, how do you live in here? Don't you want somebody that is adventurous? Someone with imagination? There's a guy here, and I'm looking at right now, whom I think epitomizes that, and I can't spell him out, but I told him before he came in here, I'm going to speak about him, because he's a wild and crazy guy. <laughs> you know, are, are you prim and proper, and you know, all this stuff. Because you got a man and a woman coming together, aren't you going to become a little more like each other? He could become a little more refined and, you know, start, stop, farting in public and all that, <laughs> you know, because they think that's cute. And don't do that, you know, but he could learn how to, you know, be a little more, I, I, I hate to say it's feminine, but refined. And she could become a lot more gutsy. Hey, get on the back here. We're revving up this motorcycle. <laughs> Hey, we're going down the road. You know, I mean, that's just an exaggeration of adventure. But wouldn't it be awful to live with someone who is boring? They pay the bills. You know, they eat their uh, tapioca. Uh, they uh, have their pills on the hour. Is, is there anything going on over there? I, I, I would have been the first to divorce. I, I cannot live like this. You gotta have some energy, you gotta have some adventure, some passion, some imagination. And you know, and I do boast a little, and I hope it don't mind. I've been in 94 countries in my lifetime. I have spoken all over the world and so on, and uh, it's partly God gave it to me, but it's, yeah, I wanted to be like that. I didn't want an ordinary life. I didn't want a boring life. I wanted to be somebody. And thanks to God, I, I have you on a night like this. I'm somebody, and so are you. But how awful to live with somebody who has no adventure. They don't care. You want a catalyst, it's someone who empowers you and has imagination. Have we ever tried something we never did before, whether it's in bed or somewhere else? You want to do something? Well, we never did that. That's not our way. Well, try it. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, imagine living 50 years with the same person. I mean, if there's anything that does it in, it's boredom. Oh, my God, another year like this. You gotta have imagination. You gotta have passion. You gotta have 
adventure. And, you know, if everybody says, well, we can't afford it. You know, if you're just a money person, you know, get lost. We can never afford life. Let's do it. Put it on the tab. What the hell? Just... <laughs> What you want is what I like, and, and really today, the most encouraging thing I heard today was after the mass I had for the mothers and sons, and this student came up, and he was cleaning the tables, and, and he said to me, Father, you know, and we don't expect this, not from them. He said, Father, I always like your masses. He says, I always get something out of them. He says, you... You make it real or something. And I just, you know, I'm a hugger. <laughs> Thank you. Because I need encouragement. You know, I'm doing this. Does it mean anything? And I hope it does. But you need encouragement. And uh, where better to get it than your husband or your wife who says, you can do that. And he says, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try something new. I'm tired of this or whatever. Well, you can do it. You know, we need to encourage one another. Encourage, I love the word because it's cura uh, from the Latin heart. And you put your heart into their heart and you tell them, you can do this. And like coming here tonight, honestly, I, I had a lot of trepidation because, you know, I used to do this 25 times a week or a month. And now I'm, you know, I'm old school, I guess. And I say, can I do anything for them? And people say, you can. And then I can do it. But God, my prayer, I lean against the crucifix in my chapel. And our Lord says, you can do this, Jimmy. You do this. You tell them what I want them to hear. And you'll be all right. That's how I pray. So we need encouragement. We need someone to put their heart into our heart and say, you can do it. You can, hey, don't give in to fear. So anyway, you need encouragement. We need faith. But we need divine faith. Of course, that's what we're here for. We, you know, it's only faith that makes us believe in, in the wonder of marriage and Christ and everything. But you need a person who says, you know what? I believe in you. I mean, just I believe. four words. Isn't that something? You hear that? And where better to come from than your husband or your wife? Say, I believe in you, honey. I believe in you. I mean, that means a lot. Just four. Do you know the power of words? I believe in you. And here you are, 50, 60 years of marriage and so on, and has someone said, she always believed in me. He always believed in me. And the guys have to kind of get over to this other side of life where women aren't always, um, you know, they have been categorized. And now she says, well, I'm 50 years old, the kids are gone, and I want to become a nurse. And he said, oh, come on. Jeez. A nurse. Stay home and cook my meals. <laughs> she said, no, no, really. I'm, I'm, you know, I've only got half my life done. I, I've always wanted to be a nurse. Could I be a... Huh? I, I just, that's how I feel. And he says, honey, I'm all for you. You can do that. I know you can. And she goes back to school and becomes a nurse or whatever. You know, you got the point, that's what we must do. Because we live such long lives, we have successive marriages, we have successive careers, we have successive vocations, and if you got somebody standing behind you saying, you can do this, you'll be great, you'll just be wonderful. And hey, if it doesn't work out, we'll try something else. You need that kind of encouragement. And I thank you if you do that for your spouse. Well, we also need space. Uh, it's sort of, I love you, now get out. <laughs> <laughs> do you understand that 
do you understand? Because in the end, I came into the world alone, and I'm going to leave this world alone. So no matter what connections we make, me as priest with a clergy or whatever, or you with a spouse and children, you're still just you. You with your individual fingerprints and so on. You're still just you. You're not a connection. You're just you. So I think we allow for that. As much as I connect and communicate with you, I'm still just a me. And I think I never know me. And you never know me. And in marriage, I don't think you ever really know each other. I don't think so. You kind of get close and so on. But I don't think so. Because we're so individual because of the way God made us. And in the end, I'm just a me. Came in alone, go out alone, and that's my life. So you need space in marriage. As much as I want to connect with you and collaborate and communicate and so on, uh, well, uh, I'm still just me. I need a little bubble, a little space, a little room for me. And that's the thing about my life. I have so much time to be me that I'm quite self-centered. I think I am. Okay, are everybody all right? Any questions, problems, difficulties? exclamations because now uh, this is act two <laughs> and um, you've been wonderful you brought the best out of me I mean I, I didn't have any hesitation finding the word I needed now this is sort of how how you do this that's what this is how and all you that nod to me <laughs> you know you keep me going, you, you help me a lot. I, I always need, I need to be encouraged to keep on going. Okay, everybody says after, you know, being marriage counselor or something, they say, what's the major problem with marriage? And we just give it this uh, generic uh, word called communication. Do you communicate? And that, honestly, that, is another whole evening a talk, communication. So I need to condense it. And I would call it intercourse. And this is, uh, I used to have tapes and so on that people bought and so And it would almost always be on vital marriage and what communication means. So I'm just going to give you bits of it. Are you OK on that? OK. And I know this is awkward. I don't know that I can always do it either, but you communicate spiritually. And, and not in your house watching you or anything, but do you pray together? I just urge you to do that. And I know it's self-conscious, it's awkward and so on. You'd rather just say a prayer. But that's not the same as you holding hands, looking at God, and saying, God, you brought us together, and we're married, and we're sacramental. And you are Christ to me, and I am Christ to you. And I want to pray. And I praise you, Lord. I need to praise. I thank you, Lord. I need to thank you for life. I need to thank you for me. I need to thank you for my spouse. And thank you for my kids. For my family. For my job. For my faith. For Holy Communion. I thank you, Lord. And we do it together, see? And then I need to ask you, Lord, and you, my spouse, forgive me for I haven't always been what I should be. I know. I, I disappointed you and disappointed myself. I'm sorry. Do you forgive me? I do. And Lord, I need help to live and to be a husband, to be a wife. I need your help. I don't want to try this alone. It started 
with you in the altar, and it continues with you. So I must pray and beg you, ask you, please, to give me the grace to be the best husband I can be, the best wife I can be, the best daddy I can be, the best mother I can be. Lord, I pray that you hear me, and I know you do, and send forth your spirit and help me not to live this life alone. I can't live it alone. I can't do this alone. Only with you can I do this. So you have spiritual intercourse. You have intellectual intercourse. You're not allowed to bore to death the person you say you love. I repeat, you are not allowed to bore to death the person you say you love. And I have met more boring people than I can tell you. Are you any, are you interested, you have any interest in the world, in life, in books, in, uh, you know, uh, what's going on, poetry or history? Can you tell a story? You know, you've got to be interesting. You've got to talk. You've got to tell me who you are, not who you were, who you are. How are you today? Who are you today? Why do you want to be married to me today? Why do you want to, you know, go to work today? How are you doing? You know, it's got to be that. And you've got to share your feelings. Honey, I'm feeling mighty low. Mighty low. I'm feeling mighty low. I'm down today. Well, I noticed that since you didn't get up. <laughs> you know, but that honesty, you know, I don't feel good today. It's not my day. It's not my day. It's not my day. And so we share our feelings. Do you know how many passions there are? Eleven. Joy, sorrow, hate, love, anxiety, fear. Um, uh, yeah, there are a bunch of them. Uh, <laughs> but do you know that we all are, are familiar with the IQ, you know, and we pretty much lived our lives by having our IQ uh, delivered to us, you know, and often live with that label. But the better IQ is your EQ, your e emotional quotient. Are you fun? Do you laugh? Do you react? Do you smile? Do you laugh? Do you cry? Do you get sad? Do you get scared? Do you get anxious? Do you get angry? You know, be an emotional person. And that's who you are. Aren't you? Or aren't you? Was that killed off in you? Because I can't live with somebody who has no feelings. I had a fight with a guy this morning at St. Ed's. Uh, not a fight, but uh, anyway, you know, I, I, I blew it. Uh, he was quite wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, we're not robots. We're people with feelings, and that's the wonder of it. You know, I had this couple a long time ago. I, I used to have so many stories, and tonight I wasn't sure how many of them would come back now and then, some of them do. But this couple, they were just in a terrible, terrible marriage. I mean, they, they weren't talking. They weren't sleeping together. They weren't, you know, in the same room together and everything, but they came down for help. So. They wanted to do better, and, and I said, I don't know, at the end of the hour, uh, I said something about, well, just go home and try to, just try to show or tell each other that you love each other. Would you do that? And then they came back in a couple of weeks, and I said, how did you do? And they looked a little, you know, they were holding hands, actually, holding hands. And I said, how'd that go? And she says, well, I did what you said. I told him that I loved him. I said, I love you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they were moving on. <laughs> they were trying. I don't know how we are on time here. Are we okay on time? A little bit? Okay, I'll go a little faster. Uh, 
there's so much uh, on that subject of intercourse, uh, spiritual intercourse, intellectual intercourse, emotional intercourse. Tell me, is there any feeling in there? Do you have any passion, any feelings at all? And then do we work together? Do we laugh together? Do we, you know, cook together? Do we garden together? Do we dance together? Do we go to St. Joseph some night together? What do we do? You know, and, uh, and then you have to be sensual. You know, you have to, you know, our senses play a big part in our life. What are you to look at? What are you to listen to? What are you to touch? What are you to smell? What are you to, um, what's left? Taste. These sensual things are part of us. They should not, they should be celebrated. They should be elevated. So that when you finally come together sexually, it is the summary of all the other kinds of intercourse that you have had. I have met you spiritually. I've become one with you in, in your mind, in your heart, in your emotions, in the way we work, in the way we dance, in the way we celebrate our feelings. And then we come together in intercourse and the two become one, not in body. That can happen between prostitutes. But we become one in soul and mind and heart and everything, and the two become one. And you're wafted into the experience of divinity and unity and elevation, which God intended that you should have. And if that's not loving you, then God didn't make no little green apples, and it don't rain in Indianapolis in the morning. It's love consummated through all the levels of intercourse until you come together sexually. And the result of it is Billy and Jimmy and Marilyn and Katie and all the kids. That's what it's about. That's marriage. But you bring them into the world for a while and you have the privilege of creating life with God and then you send them on their way. Say bye-bye. Don't worry about us. We're standing here on the shore as you go out to sea, because don't worry about us. Your daddy and I, your mother and I, are just fine. We are husband and wife. That's got to exist, because you're going to be single together, I mean, without children, I mean, far longer than you will be with your children. You must love them enough to let them go. You must love them enough to let them go. And if I haven't inserted this sentence, you must leave your father and mother and cling to your spouse. You must stop being a child and be uh, an adult uh, on a horizontal level, loving a man or a woman, not someone's daughter or someone's son. And there are certain people who never let that go, and that's why they never have a marriage, because they never let them go. And the parents won't let them go either. If you don't show up here on Sunday for spaghetti, you're out. You come home. No, no. Bye-bye, Mama. Bye-bye, Daddy. I just got married. And I broke with you. Okay. This is a lovely little moment. If you're going to uh, have a healthy marriage today, you have to co-op. It's not like it was in my parents' day or anything like that, or maybe yours. You have to co-op, which means work together. You have a man who works and a woman who works, and you cannot have a, 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 a man who works and then comes home and sits back and allows you to do double duty. You can't work all day outside and then come in and do all the work inside. It has to be a co-op. Is that right? Say yes, Father. I am, I am learning to cook, Father. <laughs> well, you better, because it's got to be a co-op now. The woman is up to here with the guy saying, well, I did my work. Well, so did I. And uh, I got to do all the other, wash it, you know, and clothes and cook and everything else, raise the kids, and you sit there and watch football? No. No. That's not right. 
both have jobs and careers outside. There is a division of labor, and it includes the children having chores. If you have brought your children up, and uh, you have fed them, and clothed them, and housed them, thank you. But if you have not brought them up to feed, clothe, and house themselves, then you have done half a job. You must teach them to do this for themselves and then get married and pass it on. The worst way to raise your children is to do everything for them. You must give them chores. They must learn how to do things for themselves. They will like themselves better. The reason marriages fail is because too many kids are getting married. You know, they, they, they're just children getting married. They're not up to it. So you know what you're doing out there. You're raising children to be tomorrow's parents. And you must feed them, clothe them, and house them, but you must teach them how to feed, house, and clothe themselves. Uh, a long time ago, I saw this interview, and it was a couple in England who had been married 82 years. 82 years. And uh, they said uh, to them, how did you do this? You know, of course. We always ask, how did you do it? Well, anyway, the man answered it. This is what he said. He said, when you find a woman you love and cherish, you court her all her life. Are you courting your wife? It means a lot. With women becoming, you know, sometimes the men they hated, and uh, feminism coming in, women still want to be courted, I think. And uh, if I had a wife, I would court her all her life. It's not just the roses today or tonight, but I hope you, uh, uh, you also uh, send her letters, love letters. Put it under her cushion. One time I was giving a marriage encounter and so on, and under my door was a note. Father, you're over there alone. And we're over here. And they said, we just want you to know that we love you. I've always had so much love. That's, that's the man I became, because I was always loved. But I, you know, I'm in my room alone. But that's all right. I've chosen that life, or God chose it for me. But don't that let, let that happen to you. You must express your love over and over and over again. Love is like fresh bread. You bake it every morning. And now I'm going to finalize here. I have something to tell you about Maya Angelou. How many of you are now are wearing a diamond? Most of you, right? OK. Maya Angelou, the poet laureate for the United States one time, uh, she was looking at her diamond. And she saw how brilliant it was. And she said, how did it get that way? And then she said, a little less pressure and a little less, a little less time, and you know what di that diamond would be? It would just be crystal. And then she said, a little less time and a little less pressure. Do you know what that crystal would be? Just coal. And a little less time and a little less pressure. You know what that coal would be? Just leaves, and a little less time, and a little less pressure. You know what those leaves would be? Just dirt, and a little less time, and a little less pressure. You know what that dirt would be? Just plain dirt. That was my Angelou. So as you look at your diamond there on your hand and so on, realize that it doesn't come overnight, and I hope that you find life in your marriage worthwhile and worth sustaining forever. Uh, I need to read this to you. I love it. And then I'm going to tell you why it takes a lifetime to love somebody till death. Because it's easy to love somebody for a moment, for a weekend. You know, people having sex, they don't even know each other. You have been called to a higher life. And I hope you love it. I pray, I pray that you live 
the life you wanted to live and the life that God wanted for you. You can't do it alone. You must do it with Christ. And that is the symbol of love. I love you and I would die for you. But this is my ending, and it's from Fiddler on the Roof. And Tevye, most of you have seen the play of the musical, and Tevye is this big, heavy set Jewish man who met his wife on his wedding day. And he says to his wife, Golda, do you love me? And Golda says, do I what? And Tevye says, do you love me? And Golda says, do I love you? <laughs> With our daughters getting married and this trouble in the town, you're upset, you're, you're worn out. Go inside, go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. But Tevye persists, he said, Golda, I'm asking you a question. Do you love me? And Golda says, you're a fool. And Terry says, I know, I know. But do you love me? And Golda says, do I love you? Now she takes him seriously. And Terry says, well. And Golda says, for 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given your children, milked the cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? And Tevye persists. The first time I met you was on our wedding day, and I was scared. And Golda says, I was too. Tevye says, I was nervous. And Golda says, so was I. And Tevye says, but our, my father and my mother said, we learn to love each other. And now I'm asking you, Golda, do you love me? Do I love him? Tevye, well? Golda, for 25 years I've lived with him, fought with him, starved with him. 25 years my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? And Tevye says, then you love me? Golda says, I suppose I do. And Tevye says, and I suppose I love you too. And then the two of them sing. It doesn't change a thing, but even so, after 25 years, it's nice to know. So that's real marriage, isn't it? It's not television, it's you. God, how I hope you love each other and say so, and keep working at it. And the best possible gift you can give to your children is to love each other. So I hope tonight they will know that you renewed your love for each other. And I thank you so much for all the love that you've given me. God bless you and good night.